And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Simpkins Business Corner. It's your host, Mr. Simpkins, with the big four. Some examples of when different types of forces are acting as the centripetal force as it pertains to problem solving. So let's jump right into it. When an equation for the minimum, uh, write an equation for the minimum coefficient of friction for any gravitron with vertical walls to keep the riders from sliding down the walls. So we talked about this type of ride at an amusement park before, but it's basically like a giant rotating cylinder and they put you inside there and you go and you stick to the walls because the whole thing is spinning around. So let us consider those forces that are acting on you as you are on the wall. Well, the wall pushing on you towards the center of the circle is the centripetal force. The normal force is the centripetal force for the gravitron type of problem. Of course, you can be gravity acting down on you, but if we just left the FBD, the free body diagram as it is there, of course, you accelerate downward, which we don't. We stick to the wall. Well, it's sticky force, so that's the force of friction. And so right away, we can see there's two directions going on. There's the normal force acting as the centripetal force towards the center of the circle, and there's the equilibrium, because we're not moving up or down, of the friction force and the force of gravity. So two things to remember. Force of friction equals the force of gravity for our gravitron, and the normal force equals the centripetal force. So given those two ideas, let's jump into the problem. Uh, well, it does say write an equation for the minimum coefficient of friction, so why don't I swing this over here, and let's go ahead and break this out. All right, uh, FF is going to be equal to, oops, go back. FF is going to be equal to mu FN, which is going to be equal to uh, MG. But remember, FN is not equal to FG for this problem. Why? Because FG is up and down, FN is side to side. So we'll, we'll park that equation there for a second, and we'll come over to this one. If the normal force is the centripetal force, then the normal force is MV squared over R. And so what we're going to do here, I'm going to color code it so you can follow OK for the derivation. If the normal force is mv squared over r, I can plug that expression in right here, right? because those two things are equal. We call this substitution. So I'm going to make a substitution combining those two equations together. And what does that result in? Mu mv squared over r equals mg. Right? So... I took this equation right here, I plug in that expression, and we get to that result. And it says write an equation for the minimum coefficient of friction. Well, you notice the mass actually cancels, so that gets us to mu v squared over r equals g. And if I want to develop an expression that always works for mu, it would look like gr over v squared. All right, so look at that derivation. We set the normal force equal to the centripetal force, and we set the force of friction equal to the force of gravity. Well, let's see if we can go ahead and solve this problem then. Uh, it says they are spun in a circle at a rate of 22.27 revs per minute. Yes, I made this ugly on purpose. All right, so let's talk about revolutions per minute. Well, frequency is the closest to that in revolutions per second. So what we'd have to do if the minutes are on bottom, we put the minutes on the top and we divide by 60 seconds to get our time, uh, or sorry, not our time, our frequency in the standard units. So let me grab my calculator. And the frequency is going to be 0.371 revolutions per second. So I'll drop that there for frequency. All right. Uh, what, what, let's continue here. Uh, it says the radius of the gravitron is 4 meters. So let's consider our mu equation that we derived. Let's see what we do have and what we still need. We do have 9.8 meters per second squared. We do have the radius, 4 meters. The only thing we don't have is this velocity to square. So let's take a look at this stuff over here. We know that the velocity can be found. Velocity is displacement over time. And if we make that specific to a circle, that would be the circumference, distance around one circle, divided by the period, time around one circle. And since we know that the period is equal to 1 over the frequency and vice versa, as they are inversely related, we can derive an expression for velocity to be 2 pi r times f. All right, so let's go ahead and solve for that velocity of 2 pi r times f with the information we know. V is equal to 2 pi times 4 meters times 0.371 revs per second. I, have a feeling, I had a feeling it was going to do that, yep. And so let me get back to the problem here again. There it is. And whatever this velocity is, we just have to plug it into the bottom of our expression over there. So let's do some magic. Calculator magic. Velocity is 9.32 meters per second. We plug that in over here for our tangential velocity, 9.32 meters per second. And when you do all the math for that, the mu comes out to be 0.45, which is reassuring because 
our coefficients of frictions are usually a decimal number less than one. So that is a sample for how you would solve for the gravitron problem when the normal force is the centripetal force. Let's take a look at a different one. Uh, write an equation for the minimum coefficient of friction needed to maintain circular motion for any horizontal rotating platform with friction. So we saw the Greg Jacobs video from a college board where he did the experiment where he put a mass on this rotating platform and we are trying to figure out how much friction is needed. And so what we see here is friction is the centripetal force. But we also would have these two forces. We'd have the normal force, and now we're back where we're comfortable, where the normal force is equal to the gravitational force. And we learned those things from considering the free body diagram and considering that it's moving in a circle. All right, and so it says write an equation for the minimum coefficient of friction. So that's mu, so let's go ahead and write this in. We got FF equals mu FN, because physics is fun. FC equals MV squared over R. And mu would be equal to MV squared over Fn times R, but then we also know that Fn is equal to Fg, which of course you know is equal to Mg, and so I can plug that in. I take Mv squared over Mg times R, and of course the masses cancel, and our equation for mu is V squared over Gr for spinning around on this rotating platform. All right, so that uh, answers the first part. Then it says we have a chunk of gold bullion is spinning on a display platform. And it's given us this revolutions per second. Let's consider what that means. 0.288 revolutions per second. That fits the bill of frequency. And the radius is 2 meters. So it says what's the coefficient of friction needed to keep it from sliding off? Well, we already derived that. Mu is equal to V squared over GR. So similarly to our last one, we know the frequency. We're going to use the frequency and this idea of the circumference times the frequency to get velocity. And then we can plug that in to our final expression that we derived. So we'll plug in our 2 meters here, and we'll plug in our 0.288 revs per second there. And our velocity will have been solved at that point. My computer always starts to freak out as soon as I write too many things on one slide. So times 2 times 0.288. All right, so this is going to be our tangential velocity, 3.62 meters per second. And that is going to go into this equation up here. So let's go ahead and do that. We got 3.62 meters per second. That gets squared on top, divide by 9.8 meters per second squared on the bottom, times the radius of 2 meters, and we'll do some calculator magic. The magic happens, and 0.67 is our mu, our coefficient of friction needed to keep that gold bullion from sliding off. You notice we didn't you need to use the uh, 0.2 kilograms at all because the mass cancels if you consider our derivation up top. All right, let's look at two more. Uh, we have a, what is the orbital speed of a moon of mass m orbiting a planet of mass big m at an orbital radius of r okay so orbital speed now when you have a planet big m and a moon little m and that moon is rotating that's because there's a force of gravity causing the circular motion so that means that the force of gravity is the centripetal force well we learned this past week and the week before that i believe that newton's law of gravitation looks a little something like this Big G, the gravitational constant, times the product of the two masses divided by the uh, distance of separation squared is equal to mv squared over r. Now let's be careful here, all right? m1 is the thing that's actually doing the circle. Look, fc means centripetal force. The planet in the middle doesn't have a centripetal force. It's just hanging out there, right? So the planet on the outside is the one doing the circular motion, and that's why the m1, the mass of the planet, or sometimes we call it the satellite, cancels out. So big G m of the planet, I'll change this up a little bit, but remember m2 is just the m, m of the planet, which we originally defined as big M, so I'll just be consistent with that, uh, equals v squared over r, and then we're going to solve, it says, for the orbital speed, so we're solving for v, so let's see here, the g m would be up here, the r would go up and cancel with one r on the bottom, and if we flex our algebra muscles, that would be the speed of our orbiting moon. <clears throat> All right, now for this next problem, let's be careful about this. Uh, oh, good. It gives us a nice straightforward one. Remember we talked before about sometimes they'll give you the planet's radius or they'll give you the height above the planet. And you have to be careful that you consider the orbital radius because the force of gravity is a force that acts between two objects' centers of mass. So you need the distance from the center of one to the center of the other. And sometimes they'll give you a little bit of a tricky switch there. They don't do that here, though. They give you the orbital radius, which is nice of them. Although what's not nice of them is they give it to you in kilometers. So uh, the only thing we have to remember is that for kilometers, we have to move one, two, three decimal places over to convert that to meters. 
So I'll do this. I'll add those three zeros on there. And why don't we put it in scientific notation? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight decimal places. So 4.203, I'll just kind of round it there, times 10 to the 8 meters is going to be what our orbital radius is for our calculation. Now, there's a lot of big numbers to write down, so I'm going to pause the video, and it's all going to magically appear plugged into our formula that's up there. Then, with a little calculator magic and a little bit of time, we plug our numbers into the equation that we derived up top, and we find that the orbital velocity of Jupiter's moon is 17,355 meters per second. Interesting thing to note, we don't actually need the mass of the moon. And in fact, if you ever wondered how they calculate masses of planets, there's no planetary scale, right? This is how they do it. They observe their circular motion, and then they work backwards with the uh, circular motion equations and the force of gravity equation to determine the mass of the unknown object. Pretty cool. Last one here, when things get a little funky with tension, all right, it says we're going around. Well, what's going on here is the tension force that's this way uh, it has two components. It has an FTX, we'll call, and it has an FTY. And, of course, there's a force of gravity here as well. So what can we learn from that? We can learn that FTY is equal to FG. They have to be because the ball's not moving up or down. And we know that the FTX, the X component or horizontal component, is the centripetal force. So those are the two things we jump into for this problem. It says write an equation for the force of tension. All right. Uh, and so it wants us to derive a, an expression for the force of tension. Well, look at where theta is defined for us, and the angle theta there is pretty convenient because this would be the adjacent side, this would be the opposite side, and you notice that opposite goes with the FTY, and if we're talking about opposite and hypotenuse, hypotenuse being the overall tension, that takes us to sine. So what does that mean? That means that FT sine of theta is equal to FTY, which happens to be equal to MG. And then, of course, that would mean FTX is cosine of theta, which is equal to mv squared over r. Okay, So if we wanted to solve for ft, um, or write an expression, I should say, for ft, remember the tangent trick. The tangent trick is sine over cosine is equal to tangent. And if you can ever leverage that idea in your derivation, that's very helpful. So think about how we would have to do that. All right, let's say I plug in, uh, let, let, why don't we come over here, and what we're going to do is we're going to solve for Bang. This thing's killing me here. Yeah, keep it. Let me just keep going. Come back down here. Too much writing for PowerPoint, I guess. All right. Well, we're going to solve for FT right here. So FT equals uh, MV squared over R, and then the cosine of theta is on the bottom. I'm going to take that expression, and I'm going to plug it in for FT right there. Um, now, you might be saying, well, Mr. Simpkins, you're getting off in the weeds because you're not going to solve for FT. All right? You, you, may, you may be onto something there. But let's actually, why don't we just go to the next step here and see if we can solve for FT yet. It turns out to actually be pretty easy, right? Because FT is going to be equal to mg over sine theta. So I'm going to take a little bit of a detour here. All right. And since they actually do give us enough information here, we do know the mass of the ball, so that's helpful. And we know 9.8, of course. And we actually know the angle as well. So this turns out to be a really easy and straightforward problem. I was going to get off in the weeds on a long derivation, but take a step back every once in a while and say, wait a minute, do I really have to do all this? In this case, the answer is no, and the answer is no because they gave us the mass. They were nice to us. So the answer here is 7.16 newtons. And so I tacked on an extra part. I said solve for the tangential velocity needed to maintain the motion. So let's consider the other equation that we had because now we know, all right, now we know Ft. So if Ft cosine of theta is equal to mv squared over r, we can solve for v. So it looks like it's going to be Ft cosine of theta times r. Right, that comes up divided by the mass, and then that's going to be equal to the velocity squared. So we got to take the square root, and so our velocity should be the result of doing that math. And with a little calculator magic, we see that the velocity is 3.66 meters per second. So to recap for today, let's consider where we just came from. We showed uh, these four examples of what is the centripetal force. The centripetal force can be the normal force, like in the case of the gravitron. The centripetal force can be the friction, as in the case of a rotating platform or a car driving around a turn. The centripetal force can be the force of gravity, such as a thing that causes a circular orbit. And the centripetal force can be the force of tension. And we don't want to forsake all the things we knew about uh, components of vectors. So this was a nice little recap of the kinds of questions you might expect for problem solving for circular motion. Till next time, this is Mr. Simpkins in the Simpkins Physics Corner.